We have all been given labels, whether you like it or not. Just look at your school reports. I bet some of you have been labelled as clever, hardworking, lazy, sporty, perhaps. But what if I reminded you that not every label that you have been given is going to be authentic to you, and that some that you have taken on will not have a positive impact? And what about those we give out to others? How many times have you seen someone with a certain body shape and presumed their health status or strength? We need to be aware of them. How we use them, the impact they have on ourselves and others. And a key way to do that is to look at the ones we've internalized. And so today, I'm going to illustrate my point by talking through how one of my labels, strong, has shown up at various points throughout my life. I have always been active. Whether that's playing netball for the school, college, county or uni, taking part in fun runs or half marathons, or weight training. But it wasn't until 2018 when I really started to recognise what my body was capable of. In that summer, I started training with the world's strongest woman, Farah Fonseca, and six short months with her, I got the confidence to join a strength gym, Elite Body Works, and enter my first strong woman competition. And then in June 2019, I became Basingstoke's strongest woman. I caught the bug. <laughs> so much so that in 2020 and 2021, I qualified for England's strongest woman. I also took part in Hampshire's This Girl Can campaign due to my late uptake into the sport. And then in 2022, I became the sixth strongest natural master in Britain. It's quite a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you. Now, for those that don't know the lingo for strong man, natural means I'm drug free. A master simply means I turned 40 rather than becoming any type of professional in the sport. <laughs> and if you're curious to know what this 41 year old at 66 kilograms considers a strong, my current deadlift is 162.5 kilograms. My squat is 117.5. I know, I've got to improve that. <laughs> And I've been known to run, well, waddle, with a 190 kilogram frame across my back. So you could say I'm handy to have around should your car break down and you need a push or a tow. But jokes and stats aside, whilst today I'm living my authentic strong life and known as one of the strongest masters in Britain, life did not start out that way. I have been a medical mystery since I was born. I have had three life-saving operations to date. My first one at six weeks old, just so I could keep food down. And then my second at 22, where severe sickness bouts and intestinal pains was diagnosed as a twisted bowel. This meant I had to have half my large intestine removed and two operations to put the rest of it back in place. The first one didn't work. And whilst I was left physically fixed and with an awesome scar that I used to show my son when he was a toddler to try and get him to stop putting things in his mouth, my mental health was on the decline. Because I couldn't control the pain and sickness, I tried to control the next best thing, and that was food and exercise, which I did until my early 30s. But actually, it was my last life-saving operation, which left me completely deaf in my right ear due to a nasty congenital acoustic neuroma. That means I was born with a brain tumour on my hearing nerve, where I can really see how my label hindered me as well as helped me survive again. It took me seven years to get diagnosed. I kept going back to my doctors after I had this nasty cold about why my hearing wasn't quite back and where are these ear infections coming from? A move to London and a change in GP actually saved my life. I remember going to the ENT specialist to discuss a growth I had on my hearing nerve. My doctor had said it so casually in my previous appointment as he was referring me that I turned up on my own. I was then standing in front of a panel of brain surgeons and consultants with a scan with a tumour the size of an orange on it. I was told that if I didn't have that removed within the next six weeks, I could have a stroke or worse. I cried. I took a lot of paperwork back with me because I didn't have any questions and headed back to work to tell my boss the news and then did what I think most 26-year-olds would have done at the time. I headed to the nearest pub 
to digest the news and sink a few glasses of rosé. I also had to wait for my husband of six weeks to show up and relay the message. And that was the hardest thing for me, telling all my nearest and dearest and everyone else that had to know I had a brain tumour, I was going to be deaf, and if it didn't get removed in the next six weeks... Dealing with their emotions and questions I was not equipped with at the time. The only thing I knew how to do was put up my walls and spend all my energy reassuring everyone else that everything was going to be fine. Where inside, I was absolutely petrified. To help, we called the tumour Ralph, as in Ralph from The Simpsons. We could joke about Ralph. Ralph's a bit stupid, isn't he? But eight weeks passed, which included a Christmas and many daily phone calls to the hospital to ask, do I have an appointment yet? Before I headed to the Royal Free Hospital to be admitted. And then on 27th of January, 2009, I had my Ralph extraction. A 10-hour operation ended up being closer to 15, but I didn't care, I was asleep. I woke up relieved I had survived again. Seven days on, I was home. Eight weeks after that, I returned back to work. And 10 short years later, with many scans to check that they had got it all and it hadn't grown back, I was formally discharged. My strong label had been reinforced as one as having the ability to fight for my life was having a calm exterior, when inside I felt nothing like a superwoman. I just felt like a survivor dealing with the medical challenges that I had to keep facing. And funnily enough, it was none of those that gave me my label. When I really thought about it, I believe my strong label originated during my first experience of heartbreak. It's 1990, it's Christmas, and my dad has left because he's met someone else. Now, some of you may know or have experienced being part of a divorced family in 1990 was quite taboo. The words broken home were used a lot to describe my living situation, and even my primary school teacher stood up in front of the class to tell everyone I might be a bit sad because my dad has left because he's got a new family. God, you've got to love the 90s. <laughs> Well-meaning family friends rallied around us, and they kept telling me to be strong, to stay strong. And what they didn't know, and neither did I at the time, was that that label would become like kryptonite to me. I would take it on as an identity, as a sense of duty. And my first assignment was to protect my sister from the horrible things that were being said and to show my mum, we've got this. I was eight. But actually, and ironically, it was my worst experience of heartbreak that would expose that label to have caught me in what I've coined a positive label trap. We're now in 2013, a few decades later. I'm in the midst of new parenthood, starting a marketing agency with my best friend Polly. She's there if everyone wants to stare at her for five minutes. And dealing with an increasingly financially and mentally abusive marriage. My mum is diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and given six months to live. With the news, I moved myself, my son and my husband up to Basingstoke to be with the family. To add more magic to that year, my granddad, my mum's dad, Percy, passed away not so long after hearing her news. And my mum, being an only child, had to deal with things like probate and selling his estate whilst just waiting for her treatment to start. But it was actually three years into that six months prognosis when I really started to see that every day with her was a gift. And I didn't get my dates mixed up. She was a badass. She lasted for six years. I was watching my mum's health decline in front of me, but I was still trying to be this tower of strength that I only knew how to be. Because the thought of losing her and dealing with my marriage was just too much to bear. But grief was seeping through the cracks of my strong exterior, and along with it was coming anger, shame, and fear. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to turn to, because I was always the person that people turned to. So I got help, because I'd hit my low, and my strong label was fraudulent. 
the best thing I did was start to see my therapist. She taught me to be truly strong. I had to be vulnerable, show my emotions, and have clear boundaries. And so, with her, we broke down my walls and honoured all those emotions that came out. We looked at my labels, got rid of a few, and reimagined the ones that I was keeping to better serve me going forward. I had to unlearn a lot of societal norms and recognise that putting my mental and physical health first wasn't selfish. It meant everyone got a more present and healthy version of me. And so, with my healing and reimagining, in 2017, I left my marriage and started my life as a single parent. In 2018, I started those sessions with Farah and found my love for strong women. In 2019, on the 30th of April, at St. Michael's Hospice, my sister and I held my mum's hand as she took her last breath. And a month after celebrating her wonderful life, I won my first strong woman competition. In 2020, qualified for England, I bought my first home and entered the cesspit of online dating. <laughs> and in 2021, whilst qualifying for England again, I met my partner as an authentically strong Nat. And in 2022, as you all know, I became the sixth strongest natural master in, Bas in Britain, not just Basin so <laughs> undermine myself. But hopefully, now I know what you're thinking, Nat, you're so wise, you're so introspective. That's what seven years of therapy will get you. But hopefully what I've shown you today, that it isn't just those obviously horrible labels that people try to stick onto you, but it can be those positive ones that you need to be careful of as well. Because even though they may feel good at the time when given to you, they can stick to your identity like glue. And as you're public facing and private reality grow further and further apart trying to live up to them, you catch yourself in a positive label trap. But don't worry, if you think that's you, you can get out. I know, I've done it myself. And so today, I just want to give you permission to look at your labels, get rid of those that don't serve you, and to reimagine the ones that you're keeping so they better serve you going forward and to listen to other people's stories, because behind every label is a person with a story waiting to be heard, like you have listened to mine. Thank you. <laughs>